This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Well, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see you here tonight and I'm very privileged and lucky to introduce Sabrina Rachman tonight who's a um, SAS School of Advanced Study Leave You Trust fellow, visiting fellow with us at the moment. Uh, Sabrina has a PhD from um, the University of California at Berkeley and has worked previously as a curator in Vienna in an art institution. She's currently completing a book uh, entitled Empires of Design, <coughs> Austria, Britain and the Global Consumption of Modernity, 1850 to 1950. And is also co-editing a volume on consumer culture and the avant-garde in the 1920s in Central Europe. Uh, to date, she has published various uh, journal articles and chapters in collective volumes uh, on such topics as global trade and the history of the Austrian Museum of Art and Industry, discourses of folk art and the industrialism in the writings of Lois Riegel, West African peoples on display in 19th century Viennese amusement parks, and architectural exhibitions and socialist policies in 1930s Vienna. And uh, finally, the title, as you can see from the screen, the title of tonight's talk, is Furnishing Memory, Red Vienna and the Politics of Post-Imperial Design, 1918-1934. Over to you, Sabrina. Thank you so much, Katya. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to present some new material I've been working on this year. And thank you to, to everyone for coming out on a Friday. I hope that this will be a somewhat worthy start to your weekend. And at least I've got a lot of images, so hopefully that will hold your attention. What I'd like to do this evening is talk about how interior design functioned as a medium for the production of cultural memory in 1920s Vienna. I think that the Austrian capital provides a unique example of a place where the production and consumption of modernity necessitated an engagement with memory. This is especially critical given Austria's long tradition of stylistic historicism, a practice tightly interwoven with the Habsburg policy of supranational imperialism that did that dates back to the reign of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. In fact, the political strategy employed by Maximilian was literally all about memory and design. He launched a widespread campaign through the new medium of print, which he called Gedächtnis, or memory, and it dealt largely with Austrian imperial expansion through visual narratives of historical events and contemporary intercultural relations. This was the dawn of the a most aggressive policy of marrying Habsburg heirs into royal families throughout Europe. So not only in Burgundy and Spain, but there was also the famous double marriage of Maximilian's grandchildren into the houses of Poland and Hungary, which provided the foundation for the modern Habsburg Empire as it existed in Central and Eastern Europe until 1918. It was, of course, Maximilian who designated the imperial motto, let others wage war, you happy Austria, marry. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to trace the origins of 1920s Viennese design back to the early modern period, although I do think that there are some very interesting and relevant parallels. But rather, I'd like to stress that there's always been a close association of Austrian imperial identity, historical continuity, and innovations in design. I also want to emphasize that this is a tradition of design rather than fine art. There's a decided focus on new technologies from print media in the early modern period to mass-produced furniture and industrial design in the 20th century. And a concerted effort to make the stories and motifs of material culture accessible to the greater public, both in terms of being able to receive them visually and in having the practical means to consume such artifacts. I would therefore like to suggest that the socialist aesthetic that emerged in Vienna upon the dissolution of the Habsburg Empire in 1918 was all about a certain processing and, and popular dissemination of the relationship between his, historicity and ethnic plurality. And this was especially pertinent given the challenges of defining the cultural identity of a post-imperial Austrian republic. 
In order for us to have a closer look at design in Red Vienna, which is the name given to the period from 1919 to 1934, when Vienna was run by a social democratic city council, I'd like to briefly discuss the Austrian imperial state before the First Republic. And here we have um, a map showing the ethnic distribution of the empire around 1900. So we'll just keep this in the background. Um, the Habsburg Empire had endured a long and complex history, having been in power in Central Europe since 1278. Members of the family had ruled the Holy Roman Empire, and in 1867, they responded to increasing nationalism in the crown lands by transitioning into the parliamentary state of Austria-Hungary, an attempt at diplomacy that, graded, great, great, that granted greater autonomy to Hungary. The empire was a vast contiguous state that was defined by its defiance of ethnic and linguistic boundaries, and which was comprised of sizable chunks, if not all territory, of present-day Austria, Bosnia, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Ukraine. According to the figures given by Istvan Dejak in his book Beyond Nationalism, A Social and Political History of the Habsburg Officer Corps, 1848-1918, um, which I highly recommend to anyone interested in issues of ethnicity in the empire, um, by 1910, only 23.3% of the Austrian population was considered to be ethnically German. Ethnic Hungarians accounted for 19.6% of the population, followed by the Czechs with 12.5%, Poles with 9.7%, and Serbs and Croats with 8.5%. The remaining imperial subjects fell mostly into the following ethnic categories. Italians, Romanians, Ruthenes, known today as Ukrainians, Slovaks, and Slovenes, among others. Um, Emperor Franz Josef was the liberal and seemingly benevolent figurehead who provided a sturdy framing for the mosaic of his realms. Um, and here we have the emperor shortly after he came to power in 1848, and then this is a postcard from his 60th jubilee in 1908. Vienna of the mid to late 19th century has become emblematic in the history of modern urban planning, and this is due largely to the promotion of historicism on the part of local and imperial authorities. I should add that when I say historicism, I'm referring to a style in architecture, design, and the fine arts, which borrows motifs and structural elements from different time periods, often with the aim of establishing a seemingly organic continuity between the past and present. This is different from the predominantly German school of thought that Ian Hacking has defined as the theory that social and cultural phenomena are historically determined and that each period in history has its own values that are, that are not directly applicable to other epochs, and which Deepish Chakraborty examines critically in his book Provincializing Europe. The brand of historicism that I allude to is an aesthetic practice of revivalism that is inextricably tied to the development of the Ringstrasse the grand boulevard that had replaced Vienna's medieval city walls and been opened ceremoniously on May 1st, 1867. Um, and here I'm going to show you just quickly some images from the Ringstrasse as we get an idea of um, the style around the period. This is the Rathaus or the city hall done in Neo-Gothic. This is the Burgtheater, which is um, the court theater, um, which is in Neo-Baroque. The Museum of Art and Industry, which was actually the first um, building to be opened on the Ringstrasse, um, done in sort of a neo-Renaissance style. Um, and this is um, historicist interior design of the Palais Dumba. Um, this is a watercolor by Rudolf von Alt. Um, and I think that, you know, just looking at, you know, the walls and all these images, it's it could very well be a study in ornamental and allegorical excess. I mean, this is very typical, the sort of like clutter and um, different figures. In the seminal book on late Imperial Vienna, Fond de Sec, Vienna, Politics and Culture, Karl Shorsky wrote about the practical reasons for this development of stylistic eclecticism. He wrote, the pace of social change had run too fast for the development of art to match it. Unable to devise a style to express modern man's needs and outlooks, architects stretched up all past historical styles to fill the void. 
The architect Otto Wagner observed that the Ringstrasse era called an architectural commission a style assignment, a Stilauftrag. Unthinkable in any previous era of history, the very concept betrayed the separation of art from purpose, the reduction of architectural works to productions of archaeological study. In his educational theory, Wagner declared war on the training of the memory, the faculty favored by historicism. And I think that the aesthetics of forging Austrian imperial memory through the historicist style would play a major role in the conception of Viennese interior design of the 1920s, and I'll come back to this point later. Um, for now, just as a comparison to the historicist buildings in the Ringstrasse, um, these are two apartment buildings that Wagner designed um, along the Vienna River in 1890-1899. Wagner's defiant cries against Klingstrasse historicism led to his becoming the godfather of the Vienna Secession, the artists group that broke with the Academy of Fine Arts in 1897 and is now synonymous with the decadent aesthetics of turn of the century Vienna. Uh, this is a, a group photograph of the secessionists from 1902 um, and there's uh, one famous figure that some of you might see and that is Gustav Klimt with the beard sitting in a sort of throne um, just to, uh, at the end of the image. Um, and this is a photograph of the secession building um, taken shortly after its completion. It was designed by Josef Maria Olbrich, and so this was um, an exhibition space for these um, people to exhibit their new work. And that, this is the cupola of the building with the motto. Um, der Zeit ihrer Kunst, der Kunst ihrer Freiheit, which you can translate as to each age its art, to art its freedom. And this motto demanded the articulation of a new art that was liberated from the past and deliberately anti-historical in style. Although this secession may have represented a critical rupture with the artistic establishment, the liberal imperial government was keen to participate in this new mode of Austrian self-expression. In 1899, the Ministry of Culture and Education created an Arts Council with the intended purpose of furthering the ahistorical, non-vernacular, and hence universal qualities of modern art in order to unite the many peoples of Austria-Hungary. Artists, academics, and political figures served on the council, and they articulated that modern art would serve as a common visual language for the multilingual inhabitants of the Habsburg Empire. With its abstracted motifs and clean lines, functioning as an integrative idiom of expression that was in opposition to the development of national styles. This resulted in the official patronage of many modern Austrian artists and accounts for the flourishing of Viennese Art Nouveau, or Jugendstil as it was called in the German-speaking lands. Um, the painter Gustav Klimt is probably the most famous beneficiary of this program, although his works encountered much controversy on more than one occasion. Nevertheless, as Shorsky has indicated, while other European governments still shied away from modern art, the ancient Habsburg monarchy actively fostered it. And Berthe Zuckerkandl, who was one of the form foremost art critics of turn of the century Vienna, alluded to this deep connection between modernism and Austrian imperial identity in her autobiography written in the 1930s. Enthusiastically, I followed this secessionist slogan into action. It was a question of defending a purely Austrian culture, a form of art that would weld together all the characteristics of our multitude of constituent peoples into a new and proud unity. For to be Austrian did not mean to be German. Austrian culture was the crystallization of the best of many cultures. By 1903, several key figures had left the secession, Frustrated that the group's main focus on the high arts was betraying the contemporary relevance of design production. Josef Hofmann, influenced by the likes of William Morris and Charles Rennie Mackintosh, teamed up with the artist Kolomann Mozart, and together they established the Wiener Werkstätte, which would produce all sorts of design objects, uh, furniture, clothing, jewelry, toys, plates and cutlery, and interiors. Um, composed in the spirit of the Gesamtkunstwerk, or total work of art. So here we see um, an interior done by Kolomann Mozart, um, which was the reception room at um, a very famous fashion boutique in Vienna. Um, and then here's a summer dress uh, by Josef Hofmann. 
And so, you know, you really see like these these lines that um, you know, you can wear clothing that matches your interior and it's all about the Gesamtkunstwerk and having this unified, neat, clean aesthetic. In their group manifesto, the Wiener Werkstätte proclaimed that utilitarian objects of art should involve a synthesis of new styles with older craft traditions. This would lead not only to an aesthetic enhancement of the consumer's life, but it would also provide a link between the modernist present and the techniques, although not necessarily aesthetics, of vernacular craftsmanship. Although the Wiener Werkstätte sought to establish a program that would lead to greater public access to modern design products, Hofmann and Moser were never under the illusion that all sectors of society would be able to afford their finely crafted objects. Although they often argued that they were indeed thrifty because they used semi-precious instead of precious stones in their jewelry creations, which is quite amusing, um, but m most people cannot afford these things. Um, it is with the Wiener Werkstätte, however, and this is sort of a key term I want to highlight, um, that the phenomenon of Wiener Raumkunst, which you could translate literally as Viennese room art or interior design, became a serious international enterprise. Um, and this is the dining room of the Palais Stockle in Brussels, which was done by Josef Hoffmann and Gustav Klimt. You see Klimt's famous painting style from his golden period um, on the walls. And so interior design just before the outbreak of the First World War became the most celebrated and popular visual art form in Vienna, and it would be an important tool in the transition from imperial rule to Austro-Marxist leadership. While the secessionists and the Wiener Werkstätte were plotting a new living aesthetic for modern Austria, a group of Marxist thinkers were plotting a model for a new Austrian state. As nationalist sentiment was on the rise throughout the Crownlands, and with the Emperor Franz Josef having celebrated his Diamond Jubilee in 1908, it became increasingly evident that Austria-Hungary might not survive that much longer. Meeting regularly in the very historicist space of the Café Central, uh, Rudolf Hilferding, Otto Bauer, Max Adler, and Karl Renner devised a plan for the evolution of the ancient imperial order into a Marxist state. They advocated equal parliamentary representation for the various ethnic groups of the empire, which they believed would overcome the power struggles of nationalist movements. Their ultimate goal was for Austria-Hungary to be transformed into a Nationalitätenstaat, or state of nationalities, providing social equality whilst maintaining the ethnic plurality of the supranational Habsburg model. According to Otto Bauer, for example, in his uh, foundational Austro-Marxist publication from 1907, The Nationalities Question and Social Democracy. Bourgeois social exclusivity manifested itself most powerfully in nationalist phenomena. So I think it's important to stress here the continued ideal of transcending the national and ensuring that post-imperial Austria hold on to its intrinsically pluralist shape. I should also note that there was another prominent Marxist who could often be found playing chess in this cafe, while the Austro-Marxists were meeting there. Leon Trotsky, who was in exile in Vienna from 1907 to 1914, wrote the following remark about this group of men in his autobiography, which I think says a lot about the Austrian peculiarity of this movement. Uh, Trotsky wrote, they were well-educated people whose knowledge of various subjects was superior to mine. I listened with intense and, one might almost say, respectful, interest to their conversation in the Central Cafe. But very soon I grew puzzled. These people were not revolutionaries. <laughs> and here is a map um, with the successor states of Austria, Hungary. When the Habsburg Empire was officially dis dissolved in October 1918, the Social Democrats, proponents of the Austro-Marxist insistence upon maintaining a multinational Austrian state, found themselves confronted with a much smaller alpine republic. So um, we see just here this really tiny state of German Austria, which has just been cut off from all of its resources. Um, this residual state experienced economic collapse and widespread hunger. As Austria was left with the provinces that were the poorest in natural resources and most expensive to maintain, 
As the architectural historian Yves Blau has described the situation, with the drawing of the new national boundaries, Vienna, where both industry and population were concentrated in the new state, its 1.8 million inhabitants in 1918 represented a little less than one-third of the total population of the Republic, was suddenly cut off from essential supplies of coal from Silesia and Bohemia, oil from Galicia, and food produced in Hungary, Moravia, and southern Styria. These resources were now beyond Austrian borders and were inaccessible because of high tariff barriers erected by hostile successor states. The policy of maintaining supranational stability amongst the multi-ethnic population of the empire was thus transposed onto eliminating class conflict in the post-imperial Austrian state. And it should also be noted that the Viennese working class was by no means an ethnically homogenous group. And I think in terms of its ethnic makeup, it was really representative of the Austrian imperial identity more so than the remaining groups. Um, especially the middle class, because um, the Viennese middle class was becoming more and more identified with German nationalism. So I think that we can view this socialist program as an attempt to salvage the culture of Austria-Hungary. I, sh I should also say that, uh, more generally, that in 1920s Austria, there was significant tension between the socialist capital and the conservative Christian socialist provinces, which would result violently in the Austrian Civil War of 1934. Vienna was at this point extremely isolated um, in the sphere that we're talking about right now, especially as its crucial cultural and economic ties to the urban centers of Prague, Budapest, and Trieste had been severed following the war. Alongside food shortages, post-imperial Vienna inherited a massive housing problem that was rooted in the city's rapid population growth during the 19th century. This was made more acute by wartime immigration, the deterioration of old buildings during the war, and the halt to new construction projects. Shortly after the Social Democrats gained control of the city, they embarked on a formidable building scheme to create new affordable housing, as well as a new housing culture, a bon culture, for those who were to be rehoused or who would finally have a place of their own to live. And this is, um, actually a three-dimensional model from Otto Neurath's Museum for Society and Economy in Vienna that was displayed in 1930, um, showing the, the living units that were built up to 1930. So it kind of, they look like monopoly pieces of it. Um, the red pieces uh, represent settlements. There was a big settlement movement in Vienna that was tied up with allotment gardening, um, which I'm not going to talk about now, but uh, more important for our purposes are the big white blocks that vary in shape, and those are the Gemeinde development, which um, we'll hear more about in a second. But you see they're distributed all over the city and um, are of various sizes. So by 1934, um, which is the official date that marked the end of Red Vienna due to uh, the Civil War and the subsequent Austro-Fascist takeover, 400 Gemeindebauten, or social housing blocks, were built throughout all of Vienna's 23 districts, with 64,000 new living units created in order to accommodate the urban population. In the Gemeindebauten, workers' housing was incorporated with a wide range of public facilities, including kindergartens, libraries, medical clinics, theaters, sports facilities, cooperative stores, and public gardens. And we don't have time to go into the architectural facades of these blocks, and I will always defer to Yves Blau's excellent book on the subject, which is really gorgeous, it's massive, called The Architecture of Red Vienna. Um, but I just wanted to show you perhaps the most iconic example, um, and this is the Karl Marx Hof, um, which, keep this sort of image in mind because we'll come back to it in a bit. Um, it's, just as an aside, it's, uh, it's placed in a really interesting manner in the city, it's sort of at the edge of the city, um, at the Vienna Woods, so it's sort of this massive social housing block in a really idyllic setting, not far from the Danube. Now I'd like to turn to the interior design initiatives carried out by the socialist municipal government, focusing specifically on the way in which they engaged with pre-war imperial discourses of vernacular and modernist aesthetics. But first I thought I'd lay out some of the administrative structures that were put in place to ensure that the residents of post-imperial Vienna 
engaged actively and thoughtfully with the furnishing of their homes. This might seem like an odd thing for a local government to invest in so heavily. I mean, this is what a massive proportion of their money was going towards. Um, but it's not only connected to debates on hygiene and the elimination of slums, but also to the long Viennese tradition of Gemütlichkeit, the sort of culture of cozy relaxation, often in the sociable company of others. So it's all about feeling comfortable and being happy in a place where you live. An early initiative from 1922 was the idea of the architect Margarete Szczytulikowski. And here's a nice photograph of her. She lived, she died just a few days before her 103rd birthday. Um, she's a really fascinating figure. And she is perhaps best known as the designer of the Frankfurt Kitchen, um, which was designed in 1926 for the Frankfurt City Council. Um, in Germany and was the prototype for the built-in kitchen that um, continues to be so popular throughout the Western world. Under the guidance of Schutte-Lihotsky, um, an organization called the Public Utility Settlement and Building Material Corporation um, set up a goods trust, a Baden Treuhand, so that social housing tenants could order quality and expensive furniture, so new pieces, and other necessary household items. The trust was meant to be sort of a poor man's Wiener Werkstätte, evoking the memory of Vienna's golden era just a decade and a half earlier. Although while good craftsmanship and style were considerations, the emphasis was on collaborating with the design industry to raise the general standard of living or von niveau of the working class. In December 1929, a permanent interior design center and exhibition space was opened in the Karl Marxhof, called, um, it's quite a mouthful, I'll say the German because I, I think it's really amusing, um, Die Beratungsstelle für Inneneinrichtung und Wohnungshygiene des Österreichischen Verbandes für Wohnungsreform, um, which you can sort of translate as roughly the Advice Bureau for Interior Design and Domestic Hygiene of the Austrian Association for Housing Reform. Um, but it's known by, it's known much better by its acronym, which is simply BEST. So I think that, I think that this is very nice when people would say, we're going to BEST. Um, right now. And uh, the best advised tenants had to furnish their new flats and a hosted exhibition showcasing new furniture and industrial design. To accommodate workers' schedules, the center was open on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and most holidays, and the consul consultation services and exhibitions were free of charge. The best was also very much based in the pre war traditions of the Viennese Secession and Wiener Werkstätte. Its director, the architect and designer Ernst Lichtblau, had been one of Otto Wagner's students, as well as an early member of the Wiener Werkstätte. So the memory of imperial Austrian culture was being propagated, but with a new veneer of socialism. Yves Blau has noted that before the war, most working class families had been forced to move several times a year and to take in subtenants and bed tenants in order to pay the rent. But now they had a home that they could afford, that they did not have to share with strangers, and that they could count on for staying in for a long time. For the first time, the Viennese working class tenants had both the opportunity and the need to invest in the dwelling itself, to furnish and decorate it as he or she chose. For many working class families, this process of furnishing their new homes meant that they would first finally be able to accommodate the few possessions that had survived their many moves. And these were usually historical items, old and cherished family heirlooms. And then they would gradually acquire additional pieces of furniture at, the, at places like the best and other household fixtures. But unlike the Wiener Werkstätte brand of bourgeois um, interior design around 1900, matching ensembles were neither practical, practical nor advocated by the best. And this is something very different from what we see in um, other European movements around the time, which we'll see um, a bit later. Um, there's no more idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk. It's all about just taking little pieces and putting them together because that's the practical solution. Um, and that's viewed as the anti-elite solution as well. This eclectic mode of socialist interior design um, resonated with, uh, it did resonate with the late 19th century trend in historicism, I think. Um, and this is not surprising, considering that one of the foremost designers of Red Vienna was Josef Frank. 
Frank was born to an to an assimilated uh, Jewish family on July 15, 1885, in the spa town of Baden Maivin. His father was a textile wholesaler who hailed from the rural province of Hevesh in northeastern Hungary, and his mother was from Bratislava, presently the capital of Slovakia. So his or origins were sort of quintessentially imperial in the Austrian sense. His early exposure to the textile trade and transnational imperial dynamics complemented by his study of both Western and non-Western art history, and his architectural training at the Technical University under the supervision of the prominent historicist Karl Koenig, had an enormous influence on his artistic output and theoretical writings. Frank emigrated to Sweden in 1935. He um, had been working since around 1910, and um, he was able to make it to Sweden easily because he, um, around 1912, he had done the interior of a Swedish gymnasium and there met a beautiful Swedish gymnast um, whom he married. And so he went with her to Sweden as the Austro-Fascists came to power. Um, today, it's, it's really interesting. He sort of, his Austrian past is forgotten almost. He's regarded as the father of modern Swedish design enjoying near William Morris status in the way that his, uh, that renditions of his textiles are marketed in a manner fast approaching kitsch. Um, he's best known for his pioneering work with the Stockholm-based interior design company Sphinx 10, in particular his bold designs that borrow motifs from global cultural and historical sources. Before I show examples of his work, I'd like to briefly mention some ideas that he expounded in his 1931 theoretical treatise, Architecture as Symbol, Elements of German New Building. With this book, he presented an urgent and scathing critique of modern architectural practices, striving actively against the dogmatic modernism of figures such as Le Corbusier and Walter Gropius in the Bauhaus, and he articulated an alternative modernity that emerged from the multi-ethnic dimensions of the Habsburg Empire. He was extremely critical of the avant-garde's prescriptions for stylistic homogeneity, promoting instead a design, design philosophy that insisted upon individual expressions of sentimentality, and he viewed German national aims towards efficiency with great suspicion. For Frank, it was essential that architecture and design illuminate diachronic global connections in order to arrive at an art of humanity that stressed a pluralistic notion of total design accomplished through an ever-evolving amalgamation of organic motifs and new interpretations of vernacular sensibilities. Skeptical of the avant-garde's elevation of the cold, untextile, untextured metal surfaces of the mechanical and producing a future that precluded engagement with the lifestyles of the past, Architecture is simple, called for modernity that would draw upon ancient Egypt and the Renaissance just as much as it reflects the gentility of the English country house, the coziness of the Austrian Biedermeier, and the anti-ornamentalism of Adolf Loos, while um, utilizing materials and forms of craftsmanship from China, Japan, and India. Frank proclaimed rather controversially that our time is the whole of the historical time known to us. He juxtaposed old and new furniture pieces and used brightly ornate textiles to bring interiors into the living world. He demanded that the new architecture be born out of the entire non-taste or ungeschmack of our time, its confusion, its colorfulness, its sentimentality, out of everything that is lively and felt. Finally, the art of the people, not art for the people. The statement, of, the statement of the connection between art and the people um, resonates strongly with the secessionist motto a few decades earlier. And Frank's disavowal of the artist genius and his elevation of the masses led to a radical reframing of modern design and its relationship to the past, present, and future. So rather than create a sense of commonality through the streamlined aesthetic of the avant-garde, Frank sought to combine socialist politics with historical narratives in an attempt to re reveal the organic continuity of natural materials, distinct cultural forms, and humanistic progress in the destructive aftermath of World War I. In 1924, he established the interior design company House and Garten with Oscar Vlach. This was, was meant to be um, not only a more affordable alternative to the Wiener Werkstätte, which was still in existence, but its aesthetic mission was decidedly opposed to the modern Gesamtkunstwerk of turn-of-the-century Vienna. 
And whereas the Wiener Werkstätte Collective continued to work in the high modernist style of the pre-war golden years, in many ways, Hausengarten returned to the pluralism of 19th century historicism. In a 1912 essay on the work of his future business partner, Oskar Vlach, uh, wrote that change was essential in Frank's conception of interior design, as was an emphasis on a rich array of colors and forms. In this way, and deviating from the ideology of the Austrian imperial Baroque, ornament no longer symbolized social power. As the result of lively folk art, it was meant to give an optimistic tone to the urban environment. The art historians Astrid Gemeiner and Gottfried Pierhofer has, have gone as far to remark um, that if this pre-war Austrian style signified empire, then Hausengarten heralded the new commonwealth. And here, um, this is an example of a linen cupboard that Frank did for Hausengarten. You can actually I was in Stockholm a few months ago. You can still buy this um, at Sphinx 10. He then reproduced it um, for his Swedish company. Um, this fabric is called Miracle, um, and the base is made out of plywood. And I think that, oops, we can uh, see some similarities between this textile um, and 18th century Austrian folk embroidery. So we really see where he's getting his sources from. Despite its eclectic and hence stylistically egalitarian approach to Viennese post-imperial design, Hausel and Martin did not market their designs to a working class clientele. This task was taken up instead by the Austrian Werkbund, and they're the group I'd like to focus on for the remainder of this talk. The Austrian Werkbund was a work, con a work federation of architects, artists, builders, and industrial designers, established in June 1912 um, after the German model when the German Werkbund um, held its annual conference in Vienna. And although the two organizations initially were meant to be parallel in terms of their focus on quality industrial design products for the masses, I would suggest that the designs of the Austrian Werkbund took a very different, perhaps even counter, trajectory, and this is largely due to their rejection of a streamlined modernist aesthetic in favor of practices that simultaneously embrace the vernacular idioms of Central and Eastern European folk art, such as this, historical forms of design, and the innovations of modern industry. It should therefore be no surprise at all that in the 1920s, Josef Frank became the group's vice president and chief international spokesman. Ernst Plischke, a Werkbund member who also worked uh, closely with the best, said that the, that the work of this organization of designers could be defined as such. Our friendship and collective work rests on the following principle, we agree to disagree. What the new Habsburg successor states of Eastern Europe gained after the war in terms of cultural expression, political autonomy, and the opportunity to focus on the development of indigenous resources, the remaining Austria was sorely lacking. Viennese designers no longer had the diverse networks and materials that the empire had afforded to them, and I would argue that the stylistic diversity of the Austrian Werkbund represented the struggle to hold on to an Austrian imperial culture and an attempt to transform those vernacular traditions into a transnational and diachronic modernity. So the Werkbund was a modernist movement, but not in the spirit of the international avant-garde. And this was true from its very inception. It was founded as an institution of design and style reform that was to give a measured and subtle modernism within the framework of the existing imperial state. The organization met extreme challenges after 1918, as it was cut off from vernacular sources of ornamentation and material resources. Examples of such could be um, bohemian glass, um, different types of stones and woods used um, that, that came from Moravia and Istria, and textile crafts from Bukovina and Galicia. And it was also cut off from important patrons, such as the public administrative offices of the Crown Lands, who bought their goods, um, as well as wealthy private clients, including the Prima Vesi family, who were now located in the new state of Czechoslovakia. Furthermore, many Viennese artists who came from different parts of the empire returned to those regions and were now disconnected from the former imperial capital in a way that would have been impossible before 1918. Those who stayed in Vienna now had to come up with creative solutions to make up for the scarcity of materials and labor. 
As Josef Frank stated in a 1929 interview about the Austrian Bergbund, Austria is a small and poor land that is proud when anything at all is accomplished. We are living from a past reputation, which we never tire of citing. The Austrian Bergbund was thus figured in a tradition of Austrian design reform that was closely intertwined with Habsburg imperialism. Indeed, a large number of its membership hailed from the crown lands, where they were trained in the schools of arts and crafts that had been instituted throughout the empire starting in the late 1860s. In many ways, the Austrian imperial aesthetic culminated in the Werkbund and its eclectic program of interior design, the irony being that this transpired after the collapse of the empire, and so the only thing left to do was to memorialize this pluralistic identity within the new socialist framework. And I thought that we could wind things down um, by looking at some objects and interior design projects that were executed by the Werkbund. Um, starting with the packing paper. So if you went to uh, their main headquarters in the first district and you got something, they would pack this up, pack it up in this paper, which I think is really interesting because you have um, some folk motifs such as this bird and um, the man with the hat holding a bouquet of flowers that's very 19th century Viennese, very much like wrapped up in the Biedermeier, um, but with more abstracted industrial objects, um, vases, um, boxes, etc. Um, here we have glassware, so we have a drinking cup, a vase, and a plate, um, which I think is really interesting given um, sort of connections between blue glass and coming from Bohemia. Um, and you have sort of these neo, vaguely neoclassicist scenes um, etched into the glass in a way that's really reminiscent of medieval craftsmanship. But then we also have something like this, um, which is very much indicative of Art Deco. Um, and this is a steel desk clock by Franz Hagenauer. And an air humidifier. Um, I don't think that humidifiers look like this anymore, and I'm not sure exactly how this works. <laughs> um, but I think that it's really interesting. So we have a ceramic air humidifier. Um, this is by Vali Wiesel Tier. Um, and I think that this general form sort of harkens back to the Rococo aesthetic. So we have sort of a, a visit, re, revisitation of historicism here, whereas we have this figure who's um, vaguely Orientalist, um, but also connected to maybe you know modern dance. And then the Vyakupan also did exhibitions. And this was a really important exhibition that they did um, called The Good Inexpensive Object, Der Gute Billige Gegenstand. And the idea behind this exhibition was to have um, members of the general public come. This was in the Museum of Art and Industry from late 1931 to early 1932. Um, you see that just the teapot, the basic teapot on the cover, and they could sort of browse around the main exhibition space um, and learn about objects that were for sale that would have been affordable to them that they could purchase. Um, this room is interesting. This was um, a presentation room in the exhibition for private Viennese interior design firms. Um, so we have lamps at the far end, and then on this side um, we have textiles, um, mostly rugs, by the Bachhausen Company, um, which is still in existence in Vienna, and Mr. Bachhausen is still very much a presence in the Viennese art scene. Um, but this, you know, would give the working class an idea of, you know, sorts of lamps that they might want to furnish their homes with, uh, what sorts of carpeting they might like. And uh, Tonet also represented very strongly at this exhibition. Um, Tonet has a very special Viennese tradition um, going back to the mid-19th century. And this is sort of the iconic Bentwood chair from 1859. Um, Variations on this chair are in every Viennese kept coffee house. Um, people often have them in their homes. Um, so, and it's also closely tied up with this historicist Klingstrasse style, which is interesting. Um, but then what happens is, um, you know, this is beechwood, which they would have been importing from Bohemia. They no longer have easy access to beechwood. Um, and so they then start experimenting, and you know, although they're you know very much opposed to tubular steel, they do some tubular steel. These are 
bent wood, but they would mix wood, and often um, the seats were made out of plywood. So that sort of had this dual purpose of, you know, um, using what they were able to use, what they had access to, but also making it cheaper. So it's much more affordable to have something out of plywood than um, beech wood. And then they also did um, mid 18th century English styles um, in the 1920s, such as this Windsor chair. Um, and I think that's just really interesting, this sort of, um, that this is a part of Viennese 1920s socialist design, especially when you compare it to German furniture design of the period. Um, you know, this is what is going on in the Bauhaus, and this is Marcel Breuer's iconic Vasily chair. Um, so the Austrian Werkbund was very much opposed to this. They thought that it was um, very cold and in that sort of coldness, very elitist. They wanted sort of the warmth of the wood or the plywood made to look like wood. Um, this is a design for a living room by Oskar Strunad. Um, so, I mean, it's different from the historicist interior that we saw before, but it's also very different from the Wiener Werkstatt, a modernist interior. Um, I'd like to call your attention to the rug um, in the lower left corner. I mean, we see that nothing matches. I think that's the most important point of this. But if you look at this rug, um, there are definitely certain similarities with traditional rug design from Bukovina, so that was the easternmost territory of the empire. And I would like to end with this image, which um, is a living room designed by Ernst Lichtblau and the best um, in 1932 in the Bergbundsiedlung, which was a social housing estate um, that was designed in, on the outskirts of Vienna in 32 that was made up of 70 houses. Um, and I think that this sort of um, encapsulates this um, this post-imperial aesthetic, I think that the room in many ways functions as a memory box for imperial Austria whilst pointing towards a social democratic future. So if we see that rug and also the upholstery, you know, it definitely has similarities with the folk design. Um, we have the tonet chairs around the dining table. Um, we have this sort of cushy armchair that, you know, could be very much 19th century or neo-baroque, but it's upholstered with um, a very modernist fabric, and then what I, but then I also really love this like utilitarian light bulb. They're, they don't have a chandelier; it's just sort of the light bulb hanging by the wire. Um, so yeah, so I'll end with that image. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for a most stimulating talk. I mean, I for one, I'm very interested and intrigued about this sort of whole designer as a sort of anti-Bauhaus, mm -hmm. anti-Bauhaus um, uh, sort of, you know, style and fashion. So can we open this to the floor and, and ask, invite questions and discussion? Could you, could you yes. say something about the advice literature, if it existed in relation to this new aesthetic? Well, yes, that's, um, that, yeah. So the advice literature actually takes a visual form in this period um, because the literacy rates are still not very high. So um, the Museum of Society and Co Economy, which was founded by Otto Neurath in um, 1925, and they did that model that I showed you, that would have been the sort of advice um, literature showing um, he developed isotype, which is this pictorial method of statistics, and it would be using um, pictograms to um, sort of do models of how people should furnish their homes, um, how things should be built, things like that. And um, that, so I think the advice literature actually took the form of a museum space. Yeah, which was free and open to the public. And then they also had different um, offices. So there were also various offshoots of the best that were opening. So there was a lot of consultation. It's a very basic question, but I'm wondering how people actually use this. Um, do, do people follow the advice and mix and match everything? And what was that kind of legacy in terms of consumer and relationships and purchasing? Right. Um, so when we think about, I mean, the best sort of 
really opening up their office in 1929, and you know this sort of culminates in the Werkbundsiedlung in 1932. That's only a three-year period, um, and so there isn't that much of a legacy of this. People did use the, use it, um, you know. And there are these really wonderful photos of um, private gemeinde about an interior. So it was, yeah, people used it, but then um, the 30s happened, and a lot of these um, people living in gemeinde about and a lot of these designers were Jewish, and so they left, um, and that was sort of erased, yeah. Yeah, sorry, gentlemen, and then done. That um, picture you showed about Cafe Central, mm -hmm. uh, I think that was in Budapest, isn't it? In, in Vienna, there's a Cafe oh, Central in Budapest as oh, well, right. yeah. I was thinking there are two. That for that. But anyway, my question was, the thought was that, to what extent was the, you know, were the, Two uh, cities connected, and how influential was that kind of axis for the Austro-Hungarian Empire? And for its yeah, artwork? I mean, so yeah, so the cities were very much connected. Um, even though after 1867 there was this idea that they would be separate but equal, with Franz Josef being Emperor of Austria but King of Hungary. Um, the train lines were really fast. I mean, in the late 19th century, it was much faster to get between Vienna and Budapest than it is now. I mean, the train connections were far superior to they are to what they are today. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth. A lot of Otto Wagner students um, worked in Budapest, and there was a close association, um, for example, between him and Oder Lechner, who's sort of the master of Hungarian Art Nouveau. Um, but I also think that the aesthetic in Budapest manifested itself differently because Hungary had its own sort of realms of the empire. Um, and that was largely tied up with processes of Magyarization um, and cultural hegemony. So that, it's another story, but there was a lot of back and forth between the cities. Dan. Uh, yes, hello. Um, uh, there's lots of things that occurred to me, but I just wanted to mention a couple. Mm -hmm. um, one is a, a, a lady who wants a kind of question. Um, you, you mentioned this notion of round groups, which uh, became this term in interior design before the war takes on the aesthetics of the total work of art. Um, it actually, it's, it's a, my, my research, uh, I've looked at this term a lot, and mm. the photographs that you showed the Beethoven exhibition, it seemed to emanate, in fact, from that exhibition. So oh, it, yeah. It moved from Kling, Max Klinger's ideas, which were embodied in the exhibition, very swiftly into the interior design press, and hence came into okay, interior yeah. design term. So. Uh, that's kind of Thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is this, this whole amazing kind of um, rhetoric of coziness plus modernity mm -hmm. seems to me, I just wondered if you had thought about it in, in any way as a kind of return of the repressed Biedermeyer period. Uh, yeah, I have, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't repressed very much because it was only really yeah. repressed during the Ringstrasse period, but then it returns again to the next letter. But this, is, this seems to me... This is very Biedermeyer, I think. Of coziness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, you, if that, that was a kind of nostalgic. Yeah, I think that there's. That you were. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, I haven't really gone into it in that much detail mm -hmm. yet, but um, this is definitely something. I, you know, I think people talk about Habsburg nostalgia in the 1920s, but they usually um, go back to sort of the 1890s and mm -hmm. that period. But I think that this is very much going back to the sort of um, maybe the newness of the Beto Mayo period and sort of. Um, in terms of sort of um, consolidating the empire, but also having this interior coziness. Mm -hmm. well, very much Lotus principle too, which is right. Yeah. In, in, in tandem with his modernist ideas and his modernist emphasis on coziness and mm -hmm. his, you know buying old bits of furniture and sticking them in the new houses. Exactly, and actually, I cut most out of this talk about <laughs> two hours ago. <laughs> bring it back. Bring, bring it back. back. <laughs> um, but I think it's really interesting because we, we really connect him to, you know, ornament and crime and, you know, sort Absolutely. of like clean yeah, aesthetic. But, but in 1919, he wrote this incredible essay, yeah. Directives for an Art Commission, in which, yeah. you know, what he says basically um, sort of like predates what Frank is doing in terms of allowing the people to choose for themselves. Um, yeah. People do the and change. Is Andrea? Yes, I have a couple of curiosity. You, you mentioned uh, Chakraborty, uh, uh, provincializing yeah. Europe. Um, so I thought about uh, Orientalism. And mm -hmm. 
I wonder, I don't know about the, the subject, but how much you found about uh, imaginations of, of the Orient, and especially Balkan Orient. Right, okay, so... The, 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 the empire had some yeah. imagination to work. Well, there's the, um, you know, there's the, the famous quote that Metternich apparently said, which was, Asia begins on the Rennweg, which is sort of like the southeastern boulevard leading out of Vienna, you know, um, into the Adriatic. Um, so, yeah, so this is very much, this is really important um, in terms of the multi-ethnic imperial legacy. And I think that we see this a lot in the textile production that they work in, you know, so you have um, like Bosnian shawls really come into play and, you know, this experimentation with oriental Folk motifs. But I guess that there is a difference uh, I mean, before the, the, the First World War, when Empire uh, um, had some project, no? uh, political project for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and after. So, did you see any difference? Um, this is something that I'm really grappling with in my project because I actually, in terms of the aesthetic, um, and this program, I don't necessarily see a break in 1918. I think that for Austria, the break happens more in the mid 30s um, because it's not like the war ended and all of a sudden all of these you know, people who had been from Bosnia left Vienna. I mean, there was sort of this um, exodus back to the home country that happened, but especially the poor working class, they couldn't afford to go back and so they were still in Vienna. So 1920s Vienna, is still very much multi-ethnic Vienna. It's still imperial Vienna. Um, but I see what you're saying. I mean, it's sort of a, instead of imperial expansion, it's maybe sort of like grasping onto the imperial memory. And that's the difference. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, I, I, I was, um, amazed by this statement that the families moved so frequently before this time yeah. period. That's really interesting. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about, uh, I guess partly about the family life in, a, in a, an apartment like this. What was the family size, for example? You mean, so do you mean after the war? I, I guess or I mean both. after the war, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or the change. Right, so the change. Um, so one of, you know, Red Vienna had inherited this really long housing um, problem um, because, I mean, the population of Vienna was larger um, over 100 years ago than it is now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it just had this, po the population just exploded really rapidly. Um, and so I think um, I was just reading some statistics that after the war, there was, someone said that there was a 90% increase in marriages right after the war. Um, and so families were really ex expanding and becoming larger. I'm not sure what family sizes were before the war, exactly. But um, I think in terms of like oral histories that we did at the museum with people who sort of descend from these families who lived in spaces like this, um, four, four to six children, usually. And then you also have the issue of people not coming back from the war, um, the men of the household, of course. So. Yeah. Hi, uh, Martina. Hi. Um, I'm really actually I'm, I'm interested in this um, the comparison between this sort of Viennese brand of of, of you know, modernism and uh, and then their rejection of this uh, the, uh, the uh, can you say Prussian or German yeah. brand of high modernism yeah um, and uh, and the intersection with class and the mm. state. Mm. Um, so I was wondering if you could, could because you know, in, in sort of it, my very you know cursory knowledge of, of both, um, it seems to me that the German brand uh, is very much you know the, the idea of sort of bourgeois class is very it, it, there's contempt for that, and same thing with sort of these ideas of nationalism of the state. But why is the Viennese you know thread of 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 this trying to save the phenomenon when the the empire had ended? Decades ago, um, and why the insistence on you know, this kind of you know, pluralism you know, and trying to kind of save well, because I think because they don't have a national identity. I mean, what are, what are they going to grasp for? I mean, because you know, they're not German. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, their you know German nationalism was 
there's like a long tradition going back to the 19th century of that, you know, with Carl de Weber and Vienna and everything. Um, but the reality is um, that, you know, and there's talk about them, um, about them being annexed, about, you know, joining forces with Germany after the war as well, um, which is something that the austro marxists were not opposed to. But um, they can't identify with the national culture. Um, and I think um, Josef Frank, who's really sort of the mastermind behind this aesthetic, um, I was reading a letter that he wrote when he was in exile in New York in the early 40s to someone, and he sort of, he was very um, scared about this idea that if you have sort of a, like a streamlined aesthetic um, that corresponds to a national aesthetic which corresponds to exclusivity. Um, and for him that was the most dangerous thing, for people to be excluded, you know, and he had to flee Vienna, so. Um, and I think he says um, he doesn't like being in New York because it reminds him of Germany um, because there's so much glass. And he says that, you know, a little bit of glass is fine, uh, maybe a lot of glass is fine, but you can't reach the, to the point where you have um, one glass, one people, one empire. Um, and that's sort of the most dangerous thing. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Can I just pick up on that? Yeah. Does that you're talking about Frank's fears for a nationalistic style. Yeah. That surely must have been related to his fear, very realized, very well realized, of fascism. And fascism. Right, yeah, so, yeah. And actually, what, um, it's interesting what happens in the Werkbund, because um, there's a big split in 1932 between, um, in the, within the Werkbund, so there's mm -hmm. sort of Frank Ströner, the sort of uh, liberal, assimilated Jewish mm -hmm. part of the Werkbund, that, that is very much this aesthetic. And then um, more of an industrial design Bergbund, which um, is directed by um, Josef Hofmann, who was the of course, was founder of the Wiener Werkstätte. Yeah, um, exactly. And then really this is a really, really bizarre story, and I still don't really know how to explain this. But the so Frank was Frank was with Hofmann in the in the, in the, Werkbund. In the Werkbund. But then I mean they never got along. Um, but in 1932 there was. A definite split in the Werkbund uh, between sort of the liberal Jewish element and then the German national element. Um, and the president of the Werkbund um, at the time was a gentleman by the name of Hermann Neubacher. This is a totally yeah. bizarre story. He um, was the first Nazi mayor of Vienna, ended up in an Albanian prison camp after the war, and then was invited personally by Haile Selassie to come to Ethiopia where he became his personal consultant for urban planning in the late 50s. Um, so I'm not sure how, how that connects together. Um, That's about six books, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So, so he was the yeah. first Nazi mayor of Vienna? Of Vienna, yeah. Of Vienna when? Though? Of, um, in 1938. Of 1938. Yeah, after the Anschluss. And he was, no, that's right. he was president of the Werkbund in the 20s when Josef Frank was the vice president. So within the Werkbund, you have these sort of two strands pulling it apart. Just as you have two strands pulling the um, uh, secession apart. Right. That it won't on the Yeah. Exactly. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Did, um, uh, did, yeah. did the Nazis um, take any particular stance on that? sort of um, aesthetic, or did it provoke a response for them? Because if, if you're talking about bringing in all the elements from the Slavic lands, etc., and, and they were busy calling them sort of one dimension, etc., mm -hmm. then did, did they sort of react to it in any way? Or they did, yeah. They didn't like this. There was, um, I think, at the time that this is sort of going on in the socialist circles, um, you know, and Vienna is run by the socials at the time, so this is sort of the predominant program. I think that there's um, under you have this revivalism in um, Alpine folk art, which is very much tied up with Nazism. And I think in Nazism, you with the Austrian Nazis, you also sort of have this um, dual or pluralistic aesthetic where you have sort of the Alpine folk art, but sort of mass industrial design. Um, what's going on in Germany at the same time? Yeah. If there aren't any more questions, let me thank Sabrina once again. Thank you very much.